Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Carol Watts, and I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of San Jose, Santa Clara. And we host our Lunch with League on the third Thursday of most months of the year to have conversations with people who affect our lives. And today, we're so pleased to welcome Michael Ogilvie to speak with us. I'm very much looking forward to learning about the public art in the city of San Jose, and I want to know where those 400 pieces of art are in our city. Uh, but before we introduce him, I would I warmly welcome everyone to our virtual luncheon today. We have both League members and friends of ours. Uh, the League of Women Voters was founded on February the 14th, 1920, as women were about to earn the right to vote by the 19th Amendment after decades of fighting for that right. So that was just a few days ago that we celebrated our 102nd anniversary. We warmly welcome everyone, including men, to join our nonpartisan political organization. Uh, we encourage informed and active participation in government, and we influence public policy through education and advocacy. We do not support or oppose any political party or candidate. This year is an election year, so you will begin hearing about our strong efforts to help voters learn about the candidates running for office and measures on the ballot, among other things. So if anyone wants to help, let us know. Uh, today, we are so honored to present our guest, Michael Ogilvy. He is the Director of Public Art of San Jose. Michael grew up in Reno, and he's, he's a Nevada guy through and through. And he learned to love drawing when he was a, a small child. He majored in art at the University of Nevada at Reno and earned his Master of Fine Arts at the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. Before he came to San Jose in early 2017, he oversaw the public art programs in Las Vegas and Clark County. Now he is our Director of Public Art within the Office of Cultural Affairs. And he's a graphic artist too. Among other artistic endeavors, he tells the stories of historical figures in cartoon format on just one page. And as all of us know, distilling truth to its essence is hard. Welcome, Michael. Well, thank you for such a wonderful welcome, Carol, and, and for inviting me to speak with the League today. And thank you, Roma, as well, for helping organize this and, and, and provide that inv invitation, too. And, and thank you, all League members, uh, for attending. I really appreciate you taking the time to, 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 to come out here and just to, to hear about the great public art that's happening and that, that exists in the city of San Jose. Um, so uh, the, the background that Carol provided really kind of covers uh, much of my history in a nutshell, and I, I have been in the public art realm for about 25 years, uh, initially as an artist and in the past 15 years really as an administrator. Um, and one of the things that most intrigues me about public art is it has the power to transform, to heal, and to inspire. And these are really qualities that um, I hope to highlight as I go through the presentation today and that you'll you'll see that 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 this can be a transformative and positive force. Um, so I, I am going to speak to you today about how public art adds to the quality of life in our community, how it is funded, and how it is selected and cited. So why don't I go ahead? I'm going to share my screen here. And we're going to start from the beginning. Okay. Um, Carol or Roma, if you can't see the first slide that says San Jose Public Art, just let me know. I just want to make sure that this goes through. Sounds like we're good. Okay. All right. Well, the first thing I want to talk about is public art funding. So the, the funding for public art within the city of San Jose mirrors many other cities throughout the nation. Uh, the first public art program was initiated by the city of Philadelphia, and it was in 1959 where they got the idea, you know, they're putting a lot of money into building buildings, into building parks, into building fire stations. And why don't we, since they're going into neighborhoods, why don't we put a percent of that towards art so that that art can enhance that those buildings and can enhance those spaces. Uh, it was such a good idea that, that uh, many other cities began to replicate that philosophy. And uh, in fact, today, 
There are over 700 government agencies, cities, counties, municipalities that have a percent for arts program. A lot of them vary. A lot of them aren't, aren't just based off of capital improvement project dollars. A lot of them have private uh, percent for arts programs uh, as well as capital improvement. And some also uh, pull from various tax sources such as um, marijuana tax is one of them. Uh, the room tax is another one. So there's a, there's a, a variety of taxes where the funding can help uh, enhance or provide funding for art. But for the city of San Jose, we're funded strictly through the capital improvement projects uh, that, that happen. So every year, uh, a, a slate of projects is developed for the city that are needed based off of community input, based off of council um, uh, direction. And those projects go through a budget approval process and the designated CIP projects that are designated per our ordinance, there's an ordinance for, for the funding for the program. So per the ordinance, 1% of designated capital improvement projects go to public art. So we're not really often getting to select a site where public art goes because the site is pre-designated. It, it is where the building is or where the park is. That's where the art's gonna be because our funding is legally tied to that source. So I, a lot of you aren't aren't fond of pie charts, and and I've I've heard that before in past presentations. So that's a pie chart of it, but I'm gonna just try and do it in an artistic way. Uh, if you if you look at the funding source, really, um, the funding source that one percent we're the public art is really kind of like the barnacle on a whale. We're the little the little um, just hanger on there on the whale. And the whale is the base project and the base project is the, the capital project that would be the park or that would be the library or that would be the police station or that would be an environmental services building. That would be the base project. Now, when it comes to community interest, you got to flip that because usually the community is more interested in the public art than they are the base project because it's for them it's a gateway to communicate with the officials running uh, running the city. And it's also a way for them to that they're going to get something. It's like a gift. They're going to get something that honors and recognizes their neighborhood beyond whatever the capital project is. So that's that's kind of um, that's kind of how that works. So hopefully those kind of really kind of frame in your mind uh, how the funding operates and what percentage we receive by the numbers. Uh, I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, the collection. We have over 400 works in the collection. Uh, quite a few of those are digitally based, but uh, many are real based. I mean, we have tangible objects out there in the world. Uh, we have 43 active capital improvement projects. We have three gallery spaces. All of those spaces are located at City Hall, and we program ex exhibitions uh, year round. And um, we have three full time employees, as well as um, all of the artworks being conserved and maintained at all times. So we have a maintenance uh, backlog where we actually go through and uh, projects that need to be that need deep restoration we work those and then as far as just regular maintenance like routine cleaning we do that regularly too so um this it's a it's it's that's just by the numbers it just gives you an idea our work plan is really comprised of those capital projects as well as community engagement maintenance and conservation arts commission and public art committee duties uh, city hall exhibits downtown and airport focuses which are separate uh, master plans that are part of they fold they're kind of like um, they fold under the umbrella of the overall master plan and, and strategic planning as well as equity initiatives equity and diversity is incredibly important uh, and that's something we we, we we strive to make sure that is recognized in this richly diverse city that we live in the public art process i'm just going to give you this in a nutshell i'm not going to cover all the nuts and bolts because that would take the entire hour so i'm just going to just briefly that everything starts with the funding and the funding is usually related to a specific site so we get that one percent funding that becomes part of a work plan that we present to the public art committee and then the arts commission and then finally that plan folds into the overall capital improvement project uh, budget and is, a, is reviewed and approved by council every year. Uh, and when I say council, I mean city council. So once the projects uh, are approved in the work plan, we then, uh, I then really triage them. And, and when I say triage projects that have a really tight deadline, because our projects are often tied to construction, 
we have to complete our projects to coincide with the construction deadline, especially if we want to catalyze partnerships uh, such as contractors in the field. It's really important that we meet those construction deadlines. So we get we really try and work the projects that need that are the most urgent right away, and then everything else we get to as we can. Um, once once the projects are uh, triaged and delegated, we'll then put out a request for qualifications, and that's really a call to artists to, to have artists apply. Um, and we recruit locally uh, uh, most of the time, especially for smaller projects, bigger projects, especially projects that might be federally funding where we're required to open it up to a broader pool, we will uh, recruit nationally. So we'll put out an RFQ, we'll put together a, a review panel that will help select the artist. And the review, the review panel is really comprised of you. It's, it's, the, the, it's the community. So it's gonna be neighborhood residents, it's gonna be business owners, it's going to be artists that live in the community or arts professionals. Uh, we also do sometimes have internal stakeholders sit on those panels, especially if it's, if it's like the fire chief or the fire captain. Usually they wanna have some say on what artist is selected as well as some input on the design. So that team will be put together. They'll review the artist applicants. They will then select a finalist and uh, that finalist artist will be contracted by the city. And once the, the artist is contracted, then the fun begins. Then, then the artist really gets to do what we call visioning meetings. And that's meeting with the community. So we'll call meetings together. Uh, they've been virtually the past two years, but before we, they would be live and in person and we do charrettes and the artists would really get to know the community that they're gonna be working in for a little while. And the community would have a chance to inspire the artist. Uh, please note, this isn't the, these, these meetings aren't for the community to tell the artist what to do. I mean, the artists, we hire the art, artists for their imagination. And that's, that's what we want to kind of make sure they have creative liberty to use. But these meetings are really for the communities to provide input to the artist. Um, once the artist does the meetings, they, there's a design development process that happens, and there's four stages of that. There's the concept design, which is like loose sketches, uh, drawings, paintings. There's the schematic design. That design gets a little bit more fleshed out after it's been um, reviewed by community members and, and their, the stakeholder panel. And then it goes through a design development phase. And if it's a three-dimensional artwork, uh, we have to have it engineered. So there's, there's gotta be engineering for the base. There's gotta be engineering for the, the base, the foundation. There's gotta be engineering for the structure. All of this needs to happen so that the structure is safe. Uh, so if somebody climbs on it, it doesn't fall over. Um, and then that design is taken to the public art committee, which has the authority, um, they've been delegated authority by city council to approve. Of, of that design. Uh, so that once they approve, the artist then goes into the fabrication phase, they make the artwork, and then the installation phase, they install it. Sometimes fabrication and installation are the same, especially if it's a mural project that's usually right on site. Uh, and then there's a dedication, and then once the dedication occurs, the project is maintained for the life of it. So that's that's just it in a nutshell. Uh, we do have a master plan that was approved in 2007 that really kind of oversees all of the work that we do. And we also have two focus plans for the airport and downtown. But the, just the, the gist of the master plan is to really prioritize innovative public art um, within San Jose and promote that cultural diversity and innovation. Uh, incorporate public art in high traffic areas such as transportation corridors, uh, parks, things things where a lot of people congregate, um, and integrate public art in long-term planning initiatives. So those are kind of the overall um, uh, goals. There's many other goals, and I don't want to go into every single one, but that's kind of it gives you a gist of of that we do have a guiding document that that helps us proceed. So I'm going to start. I'm going to talk a little bit about public art that activates space and enhances public safety. Um, a lot of the time, our projects are about making a place better. And so in this instance, this was a wall at the convention center and the wall uh, was getting tagged pretty regularly. In the evening, there wasn't any light on it. So it was kind of a dark, dark, a little bit of a gloomy area where um, sometimes an undesirable activity occurred. So then we were brought on board to really have like a lighting slash mural slash art project, something that would activate this space. And, and we went through that whole process that I mentioned. Uh, the artist that ended up doing the work is Mona Carone. And this is the mural that she completed. And part of this mural is actually a lighting component that illuminates the mural in the evening, but it also illuminates the space. Uh, since this mural has gone in, that wall hasn't been tagged. 
um, and the undesirable activity that I mentioned has ceased. So this has been a, a really good boon to this little pocket of, of downtown. Um, this is uh, located at Santa Clara Street in the 87. You could kind of see this is a real kind of a dark tunnel uh, that in the evening gets even darker. And so when you when you're going through this and you're walking from San Pedro Market to SAP Arena, you really kind of sometimes would have felt that you uh, it was a risky uh, pilgrimage to go from downtown to the arena. And so we were brought on board. We partnered with the Downtown Association. We partnered with the Department of Transportation. We partnered with Caltrans. We wrote a grant for this project and the city actually received a grant of $600,000 from Art Place America to realize this project. So this project was all paid by grant money. And uh, we, we installed the project that on community input was an active project that would activate people uh, and illuminate the space as they walk through, hence making the space safer to, to um, to, to go through. And sometimes we're, we're brought in to just take a, a blank piece of concrete that doesn't have a lot of shade, doesn't have a lot of green space and, and turn it into something that's performative and fun and enjoyable. And so we have, uh, this is Urban Roops by uh, Fana Foreman and Teddy Cruz. And this is a lovely little performance venue for First Friday events and other events that they take place downtown. Uh, public art reduces blight. A recent project we just completed at the DuPont Street underpass had a significant, uh, this is a location that was the number one tagged location in the city. And the it was receiving at the time in 2019 through the Beautify SJ app, we were able to calculate there were around 525 tags at this location that the city had to go and clean up. Um, this was known in the 80s and 90s, this area, just so you know a little history, as the walls of fame. That's, uh, that's kind of an inside um, term that a lot of graffiti uh, users or graffiti uh, artists would term that that's where you went to make your name, you, that you'd create your best design at this location. So I had some history of, of, of urban street activity and then as, as graffiti as the graffiti art sort of transitioned to just regular tagging, which isn't as so artistic, uh, it became more blight. And so we brought an artist on board who's familiar with that history and who's also very well known in the Bay Area, local artist, his name is Jesse Hernandez. And Jesse really, he met with the business owners nearby. He met with the youth that felt that this was their territory. That was an interesting meeting. I was a part of that. Jesse handled it like a, like a pro. And he really was inspired by the input that they were giving him. And one of the, the pieces of input he received was just, you know, uh, to, to make, the, make the work cool, make the work respectable so it wouldn't get hit or tagged. And so this is really what he came up with. Uh, he really wanted to honor the first peoples. Uh, just a, a note uh, that in 2019, before those murals were painted, there was around 520 tags that at that location on those walls. Uh, in 2020, there was one. So we completely decimated the tagging that was going on in that area. So that saves tax dollars because when city staff has to go out and clean that up, that costs money. So that was a huge, huge improvement. Um, public art honors and memorializes history, people, culture. This is the Japanese American internment memorial by Ruth Asawa. Sometimes that, that honoring uh, or that memorialization is of, of things we should never do again. And so that's important because we don't want to forget these things. Sometimes it's honor social, social justice heroes. There's Dr. Ernesto Galarza. By the way, all this work is in San Jose. That's all I'm showing today is just artwork in San Jose, public art in San Jose. Uh, this is a park that was recently completed. Um, absolutely enchanting, beautiful little park inspired by um, Iris Chang, the writer Iris Chang. Um, there's a there, it's sort of a monument walk. There's various monuments throughout the park, and the park was actually designed by the artist in conjunction with the landscape architect. And you can kind of see there's a rock in the center that creates this ripple effect, and that's the power that one person can have. You can create a really, really uh, you can make a you can make a big impact. As well as you know, we honor cultural history and those who came before us, those who existed in this land before us. Sometimes we honor the biodiversity that existed in this land before us. This was in honor of um, a 
mammoth uh, skeleton that was discovered along the Guadalupe uh, River Creek when when the uh, the work to create the trail was was occurring. And so this statue really honored that that history. Or that sculpture, excuse me, that's not a statue. Uh, so public art engages technology and pushes the boundaries of innovation. And, and out at our airport, we have a, an art and tech uh, platform. Uh, really, we really kind of want the art that happens out there to have a technology to be to, to address technology in some way. And so you'll see works out there that are like this, such as Space Observer, with, which can actually it moves around, it could kind of sense sense people, and it looks like it's recording, it does not record, but you can see yourself in the screen. It's a pretty fun project, the kids love it, and I always see kids running around this. Um, this clock was just installed, it's quite beautiful, it's a choreograph, all of those hands are choreographed movements that uh, during the minute, as it's telling time, they're creating an image, it's, so it's really quite spectacular. Um, some of the work involves uh, such uh, such things as infinite paradise. So this is an infinity mirror. This is a temporary installation we had out at the airport. There was a series of infinity mirrors. So when you look into it, I mean, it's a very thin slice of a of an of an object, but it looks like it goes on forever. And one of the largest murals in the nation is on the Terminal B parking garage, and it's still there. And it was uh, the equipment required to to make this mural happen. Uh, would had to be invented. I mean, it was literally it was it's kind of like a giant dot matrix printer that's using that technology, but using it to put pucks into chain link fence. And it uh, it's really it was an impressive piece of equipment that the artist designed. And this was a another temporary project back before there were emojis. There were emoticons that would uh, project onto luggage coming off after travelers would have their flights. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, with the shades here. All right, well, public art can also provide necessary commissions to artists in times of need. Uh, we did this with the Holding the Moment project. Uh, and when COVID hit, a lot of artists lost commissions, lost work, and were in, in pretty dire needs. And we, we heard them. And so we created this project, which was really a project uh, to get artists employed, uh, similar to the works projects of the 1940s, where artists were hired to do murals throughout the United States. Uh, but this was more of just a, a, a simple piece that uh, they would be that we would pay them to display at the airport, which we did. Uh, and then it was it went into our digital archive after the, the exhibit was deinstalled and is now permanently available to everybody online through the city website. Although uh, and there were 77 artists, 96 artworks that were displayed. So 77 artists made local artists made commissions. Uh, public art can enhance community centers, libraries, retail shopping centers, and even zoos. I'm going to show just a few examples of that. Uh, this is the Edenvale Library, a Sam Rodriguez mural. Uh, this is the Capitol Park Community Center. This is the Almaden Community Center. This is on in the interior. Quite a beautiful piece when the light hits it. This is at the uh, library. And these are all little carburetors painted gold. And this is uh, the gateway to the special collections room. So it kind of uh, speaks about the preciousness of, of uh, technology that no longer is relevant. Cultivating community. This is uh, this is really a community act uh, activated project. Um, many of the hands in this Tyne Harrow are hands of workers who worked the orchards before a retail shopping center went in. Uh, including some members of Cesar Chavez's family. Happy Hollow Park and Zoo. Sometimes we just monkey around a little bit with the art and have some fun. Uh, this is a, a great example of how public art leads. This uh, mural went into a sound wall. It took us four years to get the approval from Caltrans, but the mural was so successful that Caltrans essentially asked the city how they could help fund the park that the community has been wanting to have there, a little pocket park. And Caltrans is currently negotiating with Caltrans to get that funding so that a little park can be built. So if this mural hadn't gone in first, that may never happen. So there's a lot of happy people in that community now. Here's a close up of that mural. And the kids can do selfies. So there's a little nice selfie there. And, it, and you know, having artwork at, and transportation corridors, we do a lot of work with VTA, uh, and usually VTA covers all the costs for it. 
uh, they they this is the Berryessa st station and uh, this wheel all of those objects were purchased at the nearby flea market and the artist met with a lot of the flea market owners and and it was really uh he really kind of used this as a, to create a eh, kind of a sisyphean metaphor of 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 moving things from one one place to another public art can create greater environmental respect and awareness that's a big one we have a huge percent of our portfolio that is environmental projects uh, this is a project that actually captures rainwater. This whole system was designed by an artist, and it uh, it goes underground and feeds a nearby um, legacy orchard. This is another rainwater caption system uh, designed by the great late great artist Jackie Bruckner. That's her thumbprint magnified. That stainless steel you see there, and the water when it runs off, it runs through her front, front uh, thumbprint through the pumice, and that water is then filtered before it hits the watershed. So it takes out all the pollutants. This is a project that we worked with the Santa Clara County part, uh, Poet Laureate, uh, Mike, Mighty Mike McGee, as well as uh, graphic designer Carlos Perez to create 500 placards with poems from local youth. And so these poems really kind of give a window into the world of what, the, of what younger people think uh, and, and hopefully inspire everybody to, disp to properly dispose of their waste. And sometimes our environmental projects are really just to, to, to make a community happy. Uh, not, not, the communities don't necessarily want uh, a, a storm pump station coming into their neighborhood, uh, but, but if there's something in it for them, such as a mural that, that uh, in this case, a bas-relief tile mural that talks about the history of the valley, they can get on board with that. And then, then it becomes something special. Another example of that. Um, we don't do a lot with affordable housing, but we definitely try and provide some, some homes for birds every once in a while. Public art can also be fun. And just the last few slides here that I'm gonna show, and then we'll, I'll, I'll hand this back to Carol and, and, and we'll, we'll answer some questions. But this is a, this is a temporary installation at the uh, City Hall. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to announce that this is going to be reinstalled on a long-term basis at the airport. Uh, this is XO and just sort of a, a nice uh, you know, moniker for hugs and kisses. And it was a real big hit, especially around the holiday that we just had, uh, Valentine's. And then Sonic Runway, which is now a performance venue for musicians and artists to be able to see their sound visually. So this is the visualization of the speed of sound. It's quite a beautiful piece out in front of City Hall that will be installed for the next seven years. There's a top-down view of it. Okay, well, that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Carol, uh, back to you. Thank you so much, Michael. That is wonderful. I really enjoyed seeing all those photos of, of the different artwork that we had, some of which I'd seen, most of which I've not. So now I'm ready to take a tour. <laughs> I think that would really be fun. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Roma Dawson. Uh, she's a member of our board of directors and very active in the affordable housing and homelessness issue for our league, but also for the county and the Bay Area League organizations. In fact, there's an important Bay Area meeting this coming Saturday concerning the intersection between housing and climate policies. I'll post the link in chat if you've not yet signed up for that. So if you have more questions, you can enter them into chat. Uh, near the bottom of your computer screen, or if you would like to ask your question yourself, you can just click on raise hand and I'll watch for that and we'll call on you when we can. Over to you, Roma. Thank you very much, Carol, and thank you, Michael. I had the privilege of uh, serving two terms on the Arts Commission, and I got to actually chair the Public Art Committee, uh, and I encourage all of you to engage with the Arts Commission in fact, you may want to consider actually applying for the Arts Commission. There are a number of vacancies coming up this June. And I can tell you, it, it, when Michael said public art is fun, that really resonated with me. And uh, Michael, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to see some of the projects that came through the Public Art Committee when I was still there to actually see that they're happening. And I'm particularly thrilled about the Pocket Park, the Mariposa with the Mariposa theme, which was so important to the community. And just to start off, um, we're going to go back and forth between questions and uh, chat. 
and some that were submitted earlier and feel free to keep entering questions. Uh, we have one that wants to know a little bit more, if you could drill down on how the public art process works with the public art committee. Um, what happens when an artist first comes in? If you could just talk about that a little bit more. Sure, absolutely. So when, it, when an artist first comes in, really it's about coordinating the stakeholders, which would be the review panel that I discussed, um, the, the core stakeholder, that's the core stakeholder group, and getting to, and putting together a neighborhood meeting. Uh, we invite the public art committee to that meeting, uh, but their interface with the public art committee doesn't necessarily happen at that first meeting. That first meeting is really the community meeting. And we try to do up to three community meetings for every single project. Some projects demand more. Uh, we've uh, Our gold standard has been 18 meetings. Uh, and we've had to do that just depending on the, the complexity of the project, as well as, as, as if there's any community concern. So uh, once the artist has done the community work and created a concept design, that's when they meet with the public art committee to present that design. And it's at that point in time, really, the public art committee kind of reviews the design, not necessarily from a, is this a good design perspective, but was a good process followed. And so if they if they see that that was the case, they usually approve without any without any issue. And then the artist proceeds to, to really flesh out the design. And here's a related question from Martha Beattie, who is a downtown resident, by the way. Do you have procedures in place to prevent an artist from changing the vision that was presented originally um, to another uh, that the artist decided he might or she might prefer? And of course, this is a reference back to Quetzalcoatl. Uh, mm. So if you wanna touch a little bit on how the process has improved over the years in terms of protecting the, the original vision of the project. Yeah, I mean, Quetzalcoatl is really kind of one of those learning formative pro projects uh, when the public art program was in its infancy. Uh, we do have processes for that, and essentially it's contractual. Uh, once an artist has their design or design development approved, there's no changes at that point. Now, we do understand that sometimes, especially with mural projects, when they're in the field, they have to make in the field decisions like, do I paint over this uh, electrical outlet? Do I cross this window? I mean, there's going to be some 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 minor uh, things that, and especially when you have to scale a little design that is is nine by twelve to uh, thirty by sixty feet. I mean, there's there's design decisions that just can't be made at the concept and design development level that can only be made in the field. And we do expect that, and we make sure we give the artist the leeway to to make those adjustments as needed. But essentially. The design that they get approved by the public art committee is the design that's going to be realized. Thanks, Michael. And this is uh, thank you, by the way, for highlighting uh, the reduction in graffiti and tagging and other things when respectful public art is put in place after a after a real meaningful public engagement process. But we did get a question that uh, if vandalism is still a problem, is it increasing or decreasing? Um, yeah, uh, to, you'd have to talk to our anti-graffiti team, but every time I hear uh, the numbers that they that they put out, it's it's kind of uh, appalling. Uh, the, there's there's still a lot of tagging going on. Uh, we may not be as bad as some other urban areas. I know Oakland's problem is is beyond solving at this point. Uh, we're not at that that point yet, and I do think that these right the blight measures and beautify San Jose, which the mayor implemented, have really uh, take taken the um, taking that in the right direction and, and really kind of learn from what works. And also uh, it's taken the youth that has, has been um, problematic and it's engaged them in ways like provide, especially for like Jesse's mural, they provided feedback. They got, they got the, the somebody got to listen to them. And that, that's a lot of times that's just what, what, what people want is they just want to be heard. So, um, I, it, but we, you know, the mural projects that we have aren't going to stop the tagging. Um, we can help a little bit here and there, and we certainly don't have the funding to, to go out and realize a thousand murals uh, that's going to stop all the tagging and that probably wouldn't do it. It's just going to be a, a problem that 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 is that we have to deal with and to, to continue to manage. Uh, thanks for that answer. And yeah, it remains a, a challenge. And um, we had a question about uh, the, the percent we have set aside for public art. Does that uh, go 
all into the art or is there an, an administrative uh, overhead that is taken off the top? That's a, that's a good question. So uh, in, in Roma, this kind of goes to what we've talked about before. Um, prior to the recession, public art staff was funded by the general fund. At least we had two staff members that were funded by the general fund, which is usually a pretty secure source, but we lost those positions. And there was a lot that was lost during the recession and never came back. So we um, right now we do charge our time to, per, to the percent. Uh, it averages around uh, 25 to 30% per project. But we basically, if we don't have a project we're working, we don't have anything to charge our time to. So we sing for our supper, as they say. Uh, and we we are continually, I mean, that's why we have 43 projects. We're continually working projects. So um, that, I hope that answers that question. Uh, yes, I think it does. And just to reiterate, this was a uh, uh, something that was a big blow to the arts community to lose general fund subsidy. In other words, paying for staff positions, uh, but it wasn't just arts that were picked on. It was across the city where there was an attempt to charge back staff time to uh, certain uh, revenue streams. So it's, uh, I guess we'll have to live with that a little bit longer and hope our uh, revenue streams increase. And uh, I think it's time we might as well just dig into this question because we had several ask about it. And uh, what did you think about the removal of the Fallon statue? Uh, where is it now? And do you just have any comments in general you want to make about the process? And I'll just point out for everyone that the Fallon statue was long before there was any sort of public art process in place. Yeah, thanks, Roma, for pointing that out. It really didn't go through a public art process. Uh, so, uh, but that that work hasn't been deinstalled yet. Uh, it's still where it is. Uh, the city council unanimously approved to deaccession and remove it because of the weight, the size, and the just the, the sheer immensity of, of the statues. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of an engineering challenge to do what we need to do to remove those and, and transport those to permanent storage. And that's what we're working through right now. So that's, that's where that stands. Uh, in regards to what I think, I hear the community. I listen to the community and public art is about listening to the community and, and tailoring the art to the community. And if you don't hear that community, that's not public art. That's authoritarian art. So public art is, is community driven. And that is, is, is my, my, I will stand by whatever the community uh, uh, needs. And that, and in this case, that's what they needed. Um, thank you. And I'll just reiterate again that public art in particular, all art, but public art in particular is fun. So I'm going to make another commercial. Uh, we like to uh, encourage civic engagement with our league members, but Arts Commission is a place where you do engage directly with the community uh, and hear from the community. We work with Somos Mayfair, and I know that there was a mural in uh, out on the east side where... Uh, Act, uh, Jovenes Activos came into the public, uh, came into the Full Arts Commission to speak about a, to speak about a mural and express their concerns as young people on the East Side. Do you want to just comment a little bit about how that, how that process worked uh, with the artist? Yeah, we actually, the artist is from the neighborhood. Uh, his name is Scape Mar Martinez, and he really kind of grew up w doing the urban street art, the graffiti styles, and really kind of invented his own graffiti language. It's really, really beautiful, the work that he does. And he worked with the youth for this project to try and create something that honored the space. But, you know, uh, the thing about graffiti art is, it, it's, especially if it's informed by that, that uh, written language, it tends to get pretty abstract. And, and the, the young uh, youth that he was working with really didn't understand that. And they really wanted something representational. They wanted something that looks like something. And that's often, often just a, a simply you know, a, a, a dialogue that needs to happen with the youth. But I think they got a little bit riled up by, by one of their, their leaders. And, 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 you know, it, and they really kind of gave it, gave them a chance to uh, recreate some protesting. And so that was, um, that, you know, that's, that's part of the process. And, and that helped inform the design and make, make, make changes to design for the better, so. Well, I thought it was uh, handled beautifully by the public arts staff uh, in terms of really listening. And I thought it highlighted how well our, our process works now, that there is a, a way for the community to speak up. And um, I have uh, another question. Uh, the League of Women Voters is very concerned about issues of equity 
Um, and so we did have a question, is public art located equitably throughout city neighborhoods? That's a good question. And I, and I will say that um, the public art is located throughout all districts in the city. It's everywhere. Um, now, is the funding equitable across the board? That's not that's out of my control. Our funding is is financed by capital improvement projects. So wherever that capital improvement project is happening, that's where a public artwork is going to happen as well. And as some of you may know, uh, downtown has an outsized uh, proportion of public, uh, excuse me, of capital improvement projects because that is the epicenter of commerce for the city. So, um, so downtown as well as the east side both have a significant number of public artworks. Uh, when I say the east side, I mean D5 and D7, District 5 and District 7. So between District 3, which is downtown, District 5 and District 7, that's probably where the majority of our public art collection is. But like I said, we have public artworks all throughout the city. And just so you know, I did see an advanced question about where is a map for this. Uh, we did have a map online uh, pre-web conversion, but the city just updated their uh, website about a year ago. And, and we have been uh, continually trying to geocode a new map. We hope to be able to have a new map available soon, but you can actually go on to the city website, type in public art collection, and we have a page dedicated to every single one of our permanent artworks. We have a page dedicated to Holding the Moment, which has all of those 96 artworks. Uh, we have a page dedicated to Sonic Runway. So you, if you, if you want to know more, just, just hop on the website, and there's, there's a lot of information there and, and where, where artworks are cited. Uh, thank you for that. And we did have a presentation from uh, Guadalupe River Park, and we did talk about powwow and the murals that the fabulous Juan Carlos did. And uh, we have a, a, an outstanding invitation once we're not so afraid of COVID to take that tour. So maybe some of Great. us can take advantage of, uh, of the map and, and, and do some public art tours at some yeah. point. That's great. And he, they've, they've got uh, quite a few more planned. So, um, you know, you, you might even want to wait a little bit longer. So they have a few more that are going to be be along the, the trail. But that Juan Carlos does a, a magnificent job. He's really a, a great uh, director when it comes to realizing large scale murals. Thank you. Uh, Juan uh, Carlos Arajo is vice chair of the Arts Commission, but also works with a group called Pow Wow. Uh, and he works on an international scale with murals. And, and just, uh, just so you know, Roma, just for the audience, they, they changed their name. It's now called San Jose Walls, not not Pow Wow. Oh, thank you. I did not know that San Jose Walls. So I uh, I urge you all to check out the organization and we might as well get to this question right now. And I'm sure you won't be surprised that we have folks asking about breeze of innovation at Confluence Point. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to just comment on that? process and uh what's going on there you know i, I uh, unfortunately i don't have the details that you're probably going to be hoping for because that's not a city project so i i was not in i was not in the weeds of that project uh, what i will tell you is that an architect was selected it's not a public artwork it's a work of architecture and the architect uh is and even though architects do have an art, artist sensibility their primary living is not, uh, they don't earn their living by making art. They may, they earn their living by building buildings and building the, 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 doing the drawings to build the buildings. So it's a work of architecture. It's really right now it's in our public works uh, re and parks review hand because it's going, they want it to go into city parkland. Uh, so, I, I mean, personally, I, I think it's, it's really a pretty innovative design uh, if, if it can be realized. Uh, and the way that it actually reuses or creates and reuses energy is pretty smart. And if, if future structures could actually generate energy on their own, I think that's the way of the future. But um, that's just my own personal thoughts on that. Uh, well, thank you for clarifying that. That's not something that's gone through the public art process. Correct. That's a fair statement, right? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Carol, I believe we have uh, someone with their hand up. Do you want to recognize Marie right now? Uh, yes, uh, Marie, you should click on unmute and you can ask your question. I, I didn't have a question. I'm sorry. Um, I, I can't even see me on this. Uh, I can see Michael and I can see uh, Roma, but I haven't uh, 
I didn't put up my hand. I oh, you, okay. Michael, I love the um, our um, uh, our dog that goes up the fire state uh, the fire pole. Oh yeah. Fire. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Great. That's in our neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of fun. I love that piece too. Thank yeah. you, Marie. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Marie, uh, for pointing out. Uh, and I, I guess the theme of the day is uh, public art is really a lot of fun. And uh, I can tell you, if you ever get the privilege of working with Michael uh, directly, don't turn it down because that is also uh, interesting and fascinating. Uh, I have, uh, I'm trying to scan through other questions. I don't think I've got a new one into chat, but I did have a question submitted in advance. Um, are historical monuments considered part of the public art collection? That's a great question. Um, if they came before public art, and when I say came before the public art program started, which was in 1940, uh, 1984, um, no, uh, those would have not gone through any public art process. They wouldn't have been funded through public art. Often they were just donations. Uh, and, and so those technically are not uh, public art. Now, the, the Fallon statue falls in some sort of quasi strange phase because it did come after the percent for art funding. However, there was really no public art process at that time. And so um, it was at that time, the RDA, a leadership at the RDA and the city that decided to make that artwork without consulting with the community first. So it was really kind of a backwards way of approaching public art, which they learned from and the cities learned from and we don't do that anymore. <laughs> so uh, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, we don't do that anymore. Uh, <laughs> well, this may be putting you on your spot a little bit, but do you have a favorite or favorites uh, of public art of any anything in San Jose? Oh, yeah, I've got a lot. It's hard to, you know, it's like saying, what's your favorite piece of the chocolate cake? Um, <laughs> I, I like every piece. So I, it's there's there's so many there's so many unique aspects to each piece. I do think there are some some significantly unique artworks in the city. Um, I, I will certainly say that cultivating community with the hands of the original orchard workers in the Tyne Harrow, I mean, that's a testament to the, the toil that, that took place in that land before, you know, it became a commercial center. Um, I really, really like that piece. And I try and go out there and take a look at it anytime I can. Um, I, I also really appreciate uh, what, what we're doing at the airport. There's no other city in the nation doing anything like we're doing at the airport. It really isn't. I mean, it's we really have a unique art collection at the airport that is all fascinating to look at and to just, I mean, it, it really does create that sense of wonder when you're traveling, which is what which, what, which is what great art should do. It should really make you more curious and, 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 and make you want to see more. And so that's, um, all those works are just, just lovely. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's some murals that I'm really fond of uh, in the city. Actually, Juan Carlos and his, his team recently put together a mural that honors the Muecme Alone. And it's a really beautiful mural. I highly recommend that. It really talks about the history of, of tribal leaders, uh, not, not thousands of years ago, that are still here today. Uh, so it's, um, that one's a wonderful piece. And, and, you know, this underpass project behind me, that was really kind of a, a first one of its kind projects because uh, San Jose had created this Beautify San Jose app, which is now 311 app. But when they created that, it gave the city a way to track where the hot spots are and the hot spots are where is the graffiti, where is the legal dumping happening. And, and so when you can track that information, that was a new thing. And you can also tr try and implement measures to prevent it. And you'll know what works and what doesn't. And that mural project, which is, again, it's my backdrop, and it's the one that Urban Aztec did, uh, was incredibly successful. I mean, that's probably one of the most successful projects I've ever done that, re that reduced blight in that way. Uh, it, well, this question uh, that was submitted in advance sort of ties in with that. And it is what efforts are being made to connect public art with other arts activities? Um, that's a that's a good question. I mean, we do have public art at a lot of our community centers where where a lot of cultural activities take place. Um, I, but I would I guess I probably have to ask a question is is what, what type of arts activities are you referring to? Are you talking about? Uh, I mean, we when we when we worked with the artists to develop the uh, urban rooms, which is at Parque de los Pobladores, 
uh, those rooms function were really informed by all of those arts organizations there that that wanted to have performances there that wanted to have theater outside i mean the public art helped create a space for all of that activity to occur so i mean if, is that, if that's what you're trying to talk about i mean we we engage the arts sector all the time uh, in regards to informing what public artworks are going to happen uh, whether it be direct like that or whether it be involving them within the stakeholder panel uh, well, I'm not quite sure uh, where this question intended, but I'll just point out uh, you had a wonderful section in your presentation about activating spaces. So when I think of public art, I think of space activation of drawing people, you know, it, it becomes a focal point. And of course, I am particularly fond of Sam Rodriguez's uh, mural on the outside of the Edenville Library yeah. uh, and uh, was at that opening and it was uh, incredible to see the community come together. So yeah. I, I think of the creation of that mural as a great arts activities. And you might want to talk about uh, if there's any other pieces of art that you think uh, engage the community. Yeah, I mean, the, the sensing you uh, uh, underpass the illuminated underpass that actually senses pedestrian traffic and if you are smart enough to know where the sensors are you can activate the algorithm that creates the the lighting effects um, and then uh, sonic runway uh, that's a performance venue now so we're looking to activate that this spring and bring in musicians bring in performers to really have that to, to treat that venue uh, for what for what it was made for and that's that's to create this collaboration between the artwork and the artist um, so I, I, I think that answers that question. I don't know, uh, but yeah. Uh, well, I think we gave it a, a, a good try there. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, I guess at, at this point, um, maybe uh, one of the things that I think got a lot of attention that maybe the general public wasn't quite sure what was going on. First of all, I take great pride in the public art at the airport, and I'm glad you mentioned it. And you have a great uh, staff that supports you in, in your work, longtime employees yes. of the city of San Jose. Yeah, but fantastic. recently we had uh, a piece of art that had to be taken down at the airport because it offended some individuals. Mm -hmm. And I know there was a lot of give and take in the in the press about whether it was offensive. It had someone standing on top of a police car. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that uh, how that whole uh, un thing unfolded? Uh, that's another thing where, you know, uh, and everybody should show, should hopefully know this, you know, governments don't always make the best decisions. Uh, and, and that's why they need the input from the people and so people people run governments are the best and we have this about as near as good as you can get uh, but in that situation unfortunately it was, it was really unfortunate because the the work was removed without our consultation they did not reach out to us and when i say they it was airport staff um, they did not reach out to us and before we could we could do any any kind of uh discussion or negotiation with the uh, the the people who who were offended by it uh, it was gone so it, that, that was a shame uh, we we do we did talk to them like that there were, there will certainly be a different protocol moving forward that should not be happening uh, they should not be removing work because artists do have first amendment rights um, and so it was it was an interesting exchange and you know i felt bad for the artist because the artist did not have um did not create that work with the intent to do what it did it was not that was not the purpose and it really got misconstrued and then of course um, with the hyper vitriolic political sphere that we exist in today um some some folks ran with it and really really tried to use it to create their own platform and and raise themselves within their political standing so it was just a shame shame that happened and hopefully it never does again uh well uh, public art it, that's the great thing about public art it gets people thinking uh, right. <laughs> thinking about their values. And I know you'll be interested in this question. We just had a question come into chat to ask if we're going to see any more art from Burning Man. Um, no, actually. So we, we had a just for those who don't who aren't familiar with that, we had a partnership uh, with uh, Burning Man to create a series of temporary installations called from Paseo to, to uh, uh, Paseo to the Plaza, Plaza to, or excuse me, from the Paseo uh, to the plaza and these artworks were all so just to give you a little history uh, my boss my director who's a wonderful woman very smart woman 
uh, she recognized that many of the artists that go out to Burning Man store their work in the Bay Area when Burning Man isn't happening. And so she thought, you know, well, why don't we why don't we see if they want to display it outside? And so that was really kind of the, the seed of the idea uh, that was realized uh, uh, throughout 2017 and 18. Um, that is no longer happening. Uh, that that project is is complete. Uh, what did come out of that, though, was the success of Sonic Runway was such a huge hit that the public wanted it back. Uh, the city council unanimously agreed, and we brought it back completely refabricated, re-engineered for ADA compliance and longevity, and now it's installed at City Hall. And that contract uh, that was with the artists who are local, they're Bay Area artists, um, it was not a contract with Burning Man. It was it was directly with the artist. So we really see that piece as, as an artwork that was informed by this place. And, and it was with uh, with the artist doing the artwork. Our, uh, I think we have time for at least one more question. And uh, this one came in in advance. And basically, it, it'll give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, expanding funding for public art, which is near and dear to my heart. It mm -hmm. said, are any large development projects required to include public art in the approval process? That is a really good question. And if you feel that should be the case, please write your uh, elected uh, official because that uh, the city does not have a private percent for arts ordinance. Um, prior to the pandemic, city council did vote to make that a priority. But once the pandemic hit, that priority was shelled. Um, just, a, just a piece of uh, information out of uh, 10 cities, uh, nearby 10 cities in, in the Bay Area. We are the only one, uh, certainly with the population that we have, that does not have a private percent for arts. Now, this doesn't mean that developers don't do public art, because we have a lot of supportive developers, uh, supportive companies, uh, Adobe, Google, uh, so on and so, so forth, who have pled applied materials, who have pledged to provide funds for the public art. Um, but that's really through their own corporate altruism. It's not because there's an ordinance. Uh, I, I can tell you a private percent for art ordinance can be a huge boon to local culture. Uh, for example, the Treasure Island build out in San Francisco is generating $19 million in private percent for art money, which is almost more than all the money spent on public art in the city of San Jose in its history. And that's just one project for one city. So, I mean, wow. it, can, it, can, it can have a huge impact. Uh, so again, just to be clear, uh, what Michael is talking about, the uh, arts commissioners and several arts advocates in the city have long wanted to see a private project have a percent that would be set aside for public art. And as he mentioned, um, most other cities in the Bay Area do that. And Carol, we're getting very close to 1 p.m. So I'm looking at maybe it's time to turn it back over to you. Oh, well, thank you. And thank you so much, uh, Roma, for uh, hosting that part of our program, and especially to Michael for all of your information and everything. I am so glad we are going to post the video of this on our website. So lots of more people can come and, uh, and listen and learn. So thank you so much. Our next Lunch with League is on March 17th, and we are going to host County Supervisor Otto Lee. And he's going to talk about the mental health issues facing people in our county, especially because of the pandemic. So watch for our newsletter uh, for this and other upcoming events. So thanks again to all of you for joining us today. Thanks. <laughs>